And what we just did is we just had a dance party. We just listened to Mr. Ben Rector. The song is brand new. Guess who's hanging out with me on February 22nd? Ben Rector. So excited to hang out with him. He is the best. <laughs> I listen to him nonstop. My kids know every song. If you're not already a fan of Ben Rector, you're welcome. You're welcome. Check that out every day. That's a good medication right there. A little Ben Rector for your day. Um, so excited to spend some time with him. We're going to talk about his new record. And let's talk about your new record. Let's talk about your new record. What does she mean by that? She's crazy. You're like, Kathy was acting normal. She went off the rails. You don't have a new record. Here's what I mean. You do. You have a new record. You know what I love in that song? He says, I feel like a young John Cusack. How many of you remember watching those movies? Okay. Typically the John Cusack movies tended to be John Hughes movies too, right? Say anything. Who remembers these movies? Where did she go? That girl, that girl watching those movies. Let's bring her back. Let's bring her back, right? We get so distracted and we stop living the life that we came here to live. We gotta change that, right? So where's your record? Girl, put your records on. What is it? that you really want to do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to answer some questions and we're going to talk about this. The stakes are just too high. They're just too high because the time we don't get it back. And the amount of people that are waiting for you to impact their life is too many people. They can't go hungry anymore. The world really can't tolerate it. They really can't tolerate it anymore. I spent some time can't believe I'm saying this. I spent some time with Deepak Chopra on Friday and, um, and we were talking about the world and he, I said, what's the purpose of life? He seems like the smartest person that I could ever ask that question to. And he said, knowing who you are and who you are is infinite because you are part of the one self. The, he said this, he said, as the Kabbalist would say, the Ein Sof, the endless light. And he said, you know, I was on a train last week and there was a mom and she was really busy and she was really stressed out and her baby was there trying to get her attention. And the mom was just too busy, like looking at her phone and she had all the stuff going on. So he said, so I made eye contact with this little baby. And when the baby locked eyes with me, we both smiled with our whole self. And he said, the baby is not thinking, Deepak Chopra is smiling at me. The baby doesn't know who the hell I am because the baby doesn't have an ego to know who he is or he isn't. He goes, the baby was just, I am. And I am just, I am. And we're connected and it's like fireworks. And he goes, the deeper I smile, the deeper this baby smiled back. And he's like, the baby is all joy. The baby the baby doesn't have an identity other than let's just do this thing, right? He goes, unless a baby is like hungry or needs to be changed, it's like default right there. Joy, you can feel it it's so accessible because there's no story that's keeping it into locking it into thinking it's an ego and it's not what it actually is. So it's beautiful. And our job is to do it, to be who we came here to be. And then what happens is not only do you have so much fun and you feel so good, but you you become a constant possibility reminder for everybody else. So that's, what's really exciting. And, you know, it's interesting. I saw in one of the comments today, somebody said, I wasn't going to sign up for your program because I thought, oh my God, like I can't afford this. And she's like, but then I just did. And when I did it, as soon as I did it, I just felt a, a shift. And I want to just tell you something about the way that it works. See, because it already changed her life changed, right? Why? Because when we change what we believe, we change what we believe is possible. When we change what we believe is possible, we now are living in a more expanded universe. We're all wearing a VR headset of how much we believe is here. And then what happens is this VR headset, like your thoughts, make you feel what they feel. And then you think and feel these like, heavy feelings, then you look, your brain will look for evidence that that's true. And you'll see it again. You'll feel it again. 
But as soon as you change that and then you take an action, you'll start to see evidence and possibility that you didn't see. And now you're different. Your, your vibrational frequency, your signature is literally different because people say like, who am I? Right. Most of the time they're like, well, I don't know. Like how it's like, well, would you say that your personality affects your life? It's like, I guess so, right? Your personality, is that who you are? Right? People think that, right? Well, what is that? Your personality is how you think and how you feel, makes you feel, makes you do. And then after a while, people say, oh, that's like her mood, that's her vibe, that's her personality. And then that makes, that creates your personal reality, right? So if you change that, you change everything. And what's interesting is how we just keep, we don't realize that we can only go as far as our thoughts will allow. So the, the limited thoughts, what, right, that will determine how big or how small the life gets to be. And I want to help you be in the business of you, right? That's why I am, that's why I wrote this book don't keep your day job. I'm not that interested in, I didn't go to business school, but I'm interested in you doing your life's work. And I am interested in seeing people printing money, just printing it. Like my husband literally uses that expression. He goes, you just turn on and then you just go print money. And I'm like, yeah, that's how simple it is. But we are so wired and married to the idea that it's actually not that simple. We just don't get it. We don't really understand how it works a lot of things, right? We, we, we keep coming up with this evidence that we have nothing. We don't have it. It's not there. It's like, it's all there. The people who need you. And I was saying this earlier, just on a, a Instagram live, if you heard it, but yesterday in the car, we played for the kids. We are the world. And we're listening to, we are the world. And I turned to my husband. And I said, by just listening to the song, can you identify all of the people? And he's like, I don't know, let's see if we can do it. And I said, oh, that's one of my party tricks. Like I can do that. So I'm like, Willie Nelson, Bruce Springsteen, Stevie Wonder, like you can hear it, right? Why is that such a cool trick? Because you could say, which you don't realize how often you tell yourself this, what does it matter? I'm not that different. What do I have to give? It's not that special, right? If you looked at the population of the world in 1985, I think that's about when that song came out, right? In that room, you could paint it with one brush and say, well, these are all generally the same person, right? They're mostly people who grew up in America, who chose a similar profession, who write songs about the similar kinds of things. They're so different. They're each a freaking world, right? And you feel it immediately, right? You hear Stevie Wonder come on and my husband turns to me, he goes, isn't he just the best? Don't you just feel like as soon as he sings, it's like the vibration just goes whoa, like that. I go, yeah, he's amazing. And then Bob Dylan comes on and you go, what's that? What's that sound? The man doesn't even sound like he should have ever been a singer, but there's something happening in his vibration. It's insane. I dare you to sit down and listen to Blowing in the Wind and not feel changed by it like meditate on it. It's insane that those words came to him in that way. And then if you really want to blow your lid, listen to Stevie Wonder singing Blowing in the Wind and you'll pass out. Your ego just shatters. It's so beautiful. So you're listening to We Are the World and it's like Bob Dylan. Oh yeah, that does sound different. Willie Nelson comes on. You're like, that does sound different. Dionne Warwick. Holy crap. She does sound different. Cindy Lauper. Wow. She does sound different right? They're all a universe of different. How can you compare? Like if you're looking at the notes on a piano, they look the same. The white ones look like the white ones. The black keys look like the black keys. But if you play a F, it's not a D. If you play an A, it's not a C. Like they're not the same. They don't do the same thing. In fact, some of the keys, if you open up the piano, right, they have shorter strings and longer strings. They're not the same. When I started a podcast five years ago, do you think that there were no other podcasts on like finding purpose and being your biggest self? Hundreds of thousands and millions of them. Irrelevant. 
totally irrelevant. The people are waiting there. The people you're meant to touch are waiting. The people who want to spend money for that feeling are waiting there. And we never have ever, have ever, have ever, have ever bought something. We've only bought a feeling. We don't buy things, we buy feeling. It's how it makes us feel. And so we all make a different sound that leaves a different feeling. And the problem is most people are just, the volume is off. The radio is off, right? We gotta turn it on and then we gotta open up this treasure trove. So I'm gonna do something fun today, which is just cause I have to talk to your ego, right? Because your soul is like, we're already there. We've already gone beyond the horizon and back. Your soul already saw the whole thing and goes, oh, it's so cool, come on. But your ego is really loud, right? So I'm gonna talk to your ego so that we can get it to sort of like calm down. So we can turn up the volume on what's really, what's really here. You know, all those people, by the way, all of those people, anyone I've had on the show, what's the commonality? What's the theme? What's, 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 what they have in common? What does Seth Godin have in common with Deepak Chopra? They weren't born in the same place. They don't look the same. What does Marion Williamson have in common with Howard Schultz? They don't look the same. They're not fr- right. What do they all have in common? They're plugged into self, true self. They're in state right? The ego has just moved aside. How many of you know uh, who Brian Grazer is from, um, he created Imagine Entertainment. Does anyone know any of the things that Imagine made? Does anyone know? Like, cause I know there's like DreamWorks and MGM and Paramount. And it's like, who's producing what? Do you happen to know? So Imagine is Brian Grazer and Ron Howard, and they're the most prolific team in, in Hollywood. Like they've done the most things. They made movies like Apollo 13 and A Beautiful Mind. And uh, actually the first thing that they did together was Splash with Tom Hanks. Um, but they also made shows like Arrested Development and there's like no end. Like you'll be like, oh, I didn't realize. Like, God, they've done so much, right? And I mention it because when I had Brian Grazer on the podcast, we talked about his journey and how he was a temp at Warner Brothers. He was working in like the mailroom. He was 23. He was going to go to law school because he didn't know what else to do, but he didn't really want to go to law school. And he delivered a package one day to Warren Beatty, who they asked him to send this to him. And Warren Beatty at the time was like the biggest actor. And he was living in a hotel. He was living at the Beverly Wilshire, which is the hotel in Pretty Woman. And he went up to the penthouse to knock on the door to deliver this package. And the butler said, thank you so much. And he just on the spot said, well, I need to, I need to actually hand it to him because it's legal stuff. He just wanted to meet him. So he gave, Brian, he gave uh, Warren Beatty the package. And then he said, I'm so like mesmerized by you. I just want to know, like, I'm just curious, you know, like, how do you think you got to where you are? And Brian was like this 23 year old, nobody, just like a kid. And he's like, come in. And he talked to him for like an hour. And he was so lit up. And when he got back to work, he was like, hi. He was like, he couldn't believe he just had that conversation. And he was like, oh my God, this is all I want to do is like have these kinds of conversations. And wow, it was so easy. Like this man is seemingly the most famous person right now in Hollywood. And he doesn't even know who I am. And he was so happy to be heard. Like everyone wants to be heard. It didn't matter how famous, he like loved that this genuine human soul just was interested. So it just gave him space and he, he talked to him for an hour and he thought, gosh, I just want to do more of that. And so the next day he was in that little cubicle room and he was looking out the window and he saw Ron Howard crossing in the courtyard. And Ron at the time was just known for like being an actor. Like he had been on Happy Days, of course, and a few other things. And he screamed out the window, hey, Ron Howard. And like Ron doesn't turn around because it's like kind of weird. And he kind of looks, but he doesn't answer him. And he called his office 
And his, ass- his assistant was like, who is this? And he's like, hey, is Ron in the office? Uh, she's like, yeah, he's like, great, I'm coming over. And he like showed up in his office and he walked in and Ron was like, who, who are you? And he's like, hey, I'm Brian Grazer. Um, hey, what are, you, what are you about? Like what, he's like, what, what, what is this? Like what he was like, I just wanted to meet you. Like I saw you in the courtyard, I called your name. You can't just say, you, I, I just want five minutes of your time. And he was like, okay. And he's like, what do you really want to do? Like, I'm just, and he was so enthusiastic and so cute and so like just passionate that Ron was like, well, what I really want to do is be a director. And he's like, you should be a director. You'd be the most amazing director. And he's like, what do you know? How do you know this? And he's like, I don't know. I could just feel it. I could just feel it. He's like, we should do that together. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to help you. And he's like, okay, how are you going to help me? And so he just was like, why can't I help this guy? And he went home that night and he wrote the story. Brian wrote, he felt so excited. Like, well, maybe I could do that. Who says I can't? Ron wants to direct. Why can't he direct something that I make? So he wrote up a story and he wrote Splash. He didn't write the script. He just wrote like a story about a guy who falls. Is this insane? And he comes back and he's like, I have an idea. And he's like, it's you again. Oh my God, who are you? What do you want? And he was like, I'm telling you, we could sell this. We could do this. And he's like, great, you get it sold. I'll do it. And he was like, okay, great. So then he has Ron Howard, like quote unquote, like attached to it, right? So he's like, he said, if I can sell it. So he starts calling actors, like calling their assistants, calling, and people are hanging up on him. And eventually he gets to Tom Hanks and he's like, you know, Ron Howard, um, we got this movie and he's going to direct it and we're, we're going to get invested. And he's like, okay, if you get invested, it's like, okay, I got Tom Hanks, who was like up and coming. I got Ron Howard. And then he's like, Ron, I'm going to need you for some meetings. You just have to show up in the meetings. And it's like, this guy is on, his guy does not stop. He's like, I don't stop. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And they got in this room and, and Ron goes in and he's like, okay, so the movie's about, and he starts to explain and they're like, this will never work. A man falls in love with a fish. Are you insane? And Brian goes, that's not what the movie's about. The movie's just about love and how there's like this part of us that feels like we'll never find it. And then when we finally find it, it's like, can we actually sustain it? He's like, that's what the movie's about. And this one dude was like, okay, I'll give you money, but this is going to be a disaster. Like this movie will never work. Nobody will buy it and, and nobody will get it. And Brian was like, but they will. And it was a freaking crazy success. And then they did everything else. And Brian's like, I just brought the energy. I brought the enthusiasm and I brought the vision and I brought the possibility. And Ron was kicking and screaming until he was like, okay, I get it. I'm in. I believe it. I've seen the light, you know? And what's really cool is Brian has written these books on conversations, like separate from producing every movie in the world. And he doesn't need the money. He wrote these books you should read. The last book is on conversations with people, curious conversations. And he says, when you're curious with someone, you have no agenda. You just hang out with a person and you just want to open and unwrap like a gift, anything that they want to share that they could share. You'll find jewels. So he said to his assistant when they got their first little raggedy office, all I want is for you to book lunches with me with anybody who you think is at all interesting. They don't need to be famous, but I want to lunch on the books every day with someone I don't know. So his assistant would book him someone like, this guy's a professor of Mandarin. Great. Let's go to lunch. This person works in the NASA. Great. Let's go to lunch. And so he said, I never looked for a movie idea, but I would be sitting at lunch with someone who worked at NASA and we're talking and he's like, Apollo 13. What did you just say? That's a movie. We're making that movie. He met with this guy who was like a professor and this guy was, he, he worked and talked all about schizophrenia and he was like, schizophrenia, Th- that's a movie. And they made a beautiful mind. And he's like, I've never had to force anything. I sit with humans with no agenda, but with full open excitement and enthusiasm and what comes out. He goes, There's, I don't have enough time to produce all of the movies that I could actually produce because they're amazing and they're everywhere, right? It is incredible that we are sitting on gold and people, and what do people come back to? You know what? I just don't have a few, I don't have time. That's what it is. I just don't have the time. Yeah, that's what it is. No, you know what it is? I don't have the money. If I had the money, I'd be unstoppable. But in order for me to be unstoppable, I'd have to have money. 
And what is that? That means money doesn't exist right now. It exists right now. You know, a friend of mine was diagnosed with a certain kind of cancer and needed a bone marrow transplant and needed a donor and they couldn't find one. Did they just say like, mm, we're not gonna find one? Or did they say, oh, it's out there? They said, oh, it's out there. And so they, they did something with, with the resources they didn't have, they turned up their resourcefulness. And they said, well, well, if we need a match, what if we reached out to anyone who has a platform on Twitter and Instagram and asked them to post that we're looking for this match. What if we did this? What if we did that? How can we raise awareness to try to find a match? How many matches do you think they found? Within 11 days, they found eight matches. So they saved eight lives. Now that is incredible because you can't go to CVS and pick up that match. You can't ask your neighbor for an extra cup of sugar and the perfect match for somebody's bone marrow, right? But it's there. And this is where the mind is really a problem, isn't it? Because that belief that it doesn't exist, well, that's everything. Because from there, I then begin my day. And then a year passes, a decade passes, and we go, damn it. And we go, oh, no, 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 it was fine because it didn't exist anyway. We go back to sleep, back to sleep, back to sleep, back. Why? And the thing about it is if it wasn't really available, it would sort of go away, but your soul doesn't quit. Your soul still feels upset. And so it hits you all the time. You're watching something on Netflix and you just go, ah. And then you go, I'll just scroll my phone a little more. It'll like bury it. You know, you go, I saw that. And, ah, but no, 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 no. I'll just go do this. I'll just go eat something. That'll make me feel better. Right. Your soul is like trying all the time to remind us, but that mind goes, well, this is people say, you know, people say to me all the time. Yeah, I get it, Kath, but reality is, and I go, tell me again what it is. Cause I'm just so curious what it is to you. It's fascinating. Tell me again, like reality is, and I'm like, Okay, that's a good one. Okay, or not, right? What do you mean or not? And I'm like, well, here's the evidence that this is true. Like, oh, damn it, right? So, you know, I do these five-day challenges and people get all lit up or, you know, you'll do something else and you'll feel lit up. And then we just don't realize your brain is running a program and that program is very powerful because it comes with a pharmacy. All of those thoughts come with a drip of a chemical that actually puts it in your body. So then it literally feels, doesn't just, you don't just hear it, you feel it. Have you ever had a thought of a caramel apple or a vanilla latte and you think it and then you feel it, you can remember actually as if your mouth waters, you can like feel it and taste it. That's how powerful the mind is. You ever had a dream where you're making out with Matthew McConaughey or come on, get real, right? You you have, and it felt real. That's how powerful the mind is. Your mind will not only just think a thought, it feels a feeling and then you actually experience it. Well, how often are we rehearsing and feeling and memorizing what we really desire and how much it exists right here. And the more you do that, things change. But what happens when we're not with repetition plugging in? And the reason the program is 90 days is because 90 days shows in the brain, the neuroplasticity, it moves, it changes, right? It changes. And I'm really, really interested, not just in helping you change your mind so you can change your life, but actually helping you see what's so hidden in plain sight so that you can literally wake up tomorrow and just go print some money. You have so many, I can't even, you would never be able to actualize all of the gifts and ideas that you actually have, but people don't know how to do it because we don't understand, just like we really don't get reality or the way it works, we certainly don't get the way other people sometimes respond to things, right? Moses had to come down the mountain to talk to people because they couldn't hear from up there, right? So 
when we have something, you know, we don't just say, well, I put it out there and nothing happened. Imagine the last time you think about a Pixar movie, do they just like put it in the box office or is there like 10 months of you seeing like the McDonald's toys? You go, what's that? What's in Kento? In Kento, what's that? I saw that somewhere, right? And you go, oh, that's interesting. I saw it there. It was in this magazine. Then I just saw an interview with Lin-Manuel and now I'm just hearing this song got dropped. Why are they doing that? because it wouldn't work to just like put it in the box office or put it on your Apple Plus and, but that's not how people work. We have to make deposits. We have to come into frame. We have to have conversations and then we have to repeat things. How many times did Al Gore go around the world and talk about an inconvenient truth and the environment one time? He said it 98 billion times. And only then some people went, does he like care about the environment or something? I think he said something about the environment, right? How many times did Hillary Clinton say like, it takes a village and you're like, what's that quote? It takes, who said that? Right, I think I heard her say that one time. She said it every single second, right? And the same is true for anybody, for anything like that. It takes these people who campaign for anything, brands, it doesn't matter. Like they don't say it one time. Do you understand? So the way we, the way we've tried to live out our dreams is like, Kathy, you don't, this is me. Cause I've, I lived in LA for 18 years. Right. And I'm kind of still back and forth. So most of my friends in the last 18 years are creative and they'll be like, but you don't get it. <laughs> I got it. Kath. I wrote the movie. I already wrote my movie. I'm like, so what happened? Like, I pitched it. Nothing happened. I go, you, you pitched it one time and nothing happened. Yeah. That's how it works. Right. You send one email with the script and then nothing happened. I go, that's not, that's not how it works. It, not, never. It's never worked that way <laughs> for anybody. And people are like, yeah, you don't understand. I had this incredible idea and I made these earrings and I posted it on Instagram and nobody bought them. And I'm like, oh, well, it doesn't work like that for anyone. Like there's no designer in the world who would just go, I don't get it. Like there, 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 there's a rhythm, right? There's a way that we engage people, that we wake people up, that we talk to people, right? And every single thing now for me, it's so obvious because I've interviewed 600 millionaires and billionaires who were all creative, who all made a choice to say, I don't just want to make money. I want to be in business around doing my life's work, making an impact, having fun, and making as much money as there possibly could be so that I can then do more good with it. That's every person on my show. And after you talk to 600 of those people, you go, oh, these are the things that they all do. And it works every time. But there's a lot of things that when people haven't taken a step into that or they don't understand, it's like one of my favorite expressions is we don't know what we don't know. We just don't even get what we don't know. So then we're just like, forget it. Good luck. When I went out to LA, it was 2003 and I had been watching American Idol. It was like the second season. And I would watch it and I would cry. You guys remember, like, do you remember the Clay Aiken moments? I was just like, who is this person? I was just like, done. He would like sing and I would be like, done. Because his vulnerability was like, whoa. You know, it was like so powerful. And I said to my mom, that's it. I'm going to move to LA and da, 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 da. And I actually auditioned for American Idol. And I stood online for three days. And I didn't get past even the first round. And I met Colby Calais years later. And then I had her on the podcast. And she's like, yeah, remember I have the same story? I sang bubbly. Starts in my toes and a crinkle my nose, wherever it goes. She sang that at her American Idol audition. And they were like, no. And she was like, mm, too bad. Shoot. And then one of her friends was like, really? Is it really shoot? Or is it? just a great song. And she's like, 
I don't know, maybe it's a great song. And so one of her friends without her knowing put it up on MySpace and then people like liked it and then more people liked it. And then, you know, she became, it became the number one single. And I went out to LA and my mom's like, you already got rejected from American Idol. Like it's not going to happen. And I was like, who said so? Like, how do you even know what's supposed to happen? Like I'm going. And then I just kept following these breadcrumbs, but I could always use my imagination and I would find my imagination saying to me, oh my God, it's right here. And oh my God, and oh my God, this. And, and, and then I would just follow this path, right? And take this inspired action every day. I posted yesterday, there's nothing you can't do with 20 seconds of courage. Like 20 seconds of courage to do the post, to start your business, to da 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 da, to publish your podcast. It's like, I'm that person. When I see successful people, I see a lot of courage. If you know the story of Lady Gaga, let's use that example, so much courage. In fact, we had the same producer at Interscope. I was only there for eight minutes. She was there for a long time, but um, she used to write. So Ron Fair, who is our producer, his wife is one of the Pussycat Dolls and Lady Gaga, Stephanie used to write for them. And then every once in a while, she'd be like, can you hear my own song? Like, and they would be like, hmm, not interested. And for eight years, she wrote for other artists and she was like, nobody likes my stuff, but she just kept showing up. And then it was like, how about this? And they were like, interesting, interesting. Let's try it. Let's try it. You know? And one of my good friends, Rachel Platten, she, I was with her yesterday and like her song fight song, they were like, no, every label was like fight song. It's been done. It's no. And they all heard it. And then she started playing it in hospitals for cancer patients. And one of the nurses, her brother works at a radio station. Of course, right? This is the, of course, this is what the reality actually is. This is what actually happens when you just put light in the world. And then it got on the radio and then the label was like, hey, are you Rachel? That fight song song, um, we think we might be able to do something with it. And then came the number one single. So we have to really get that what we're dreaming of and what we're desiring, uh, it already is done. It's already done. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. And so I want you guys to be able to see this happen this year. Enough is enough, you know? So I do want to say this. If you happen to come on this call, I'm going to tell my team to put it in the chat, but I'm going to give everybody who's here, everybody who's watching this right now, if you're like, I really want to be with you because I'm starting to wake up and get it, I'm going to give you a coupon code to the program and any of the bonuses that you missed, you're going to get. So if you want to hang out with Candace Nelson, who created Sprinkles Cupcakes and Sugar Rush, if you want to hang out with Morgan Harper Nichols, if you want, and you want to get a coupon code to the program, use that by midnight. We're going to give you all of that stuff. And I also want you to know that people often say, and this is just good data for you to know, and you can, you can Google this, but 65% of Americans, I mean, Americans, I mean the whole country, not 65% of people who live in Greenwich village, not 65% of people who live in Montana, 65% of the country. Okay. Doesn't know how much money they spend. Just so you know, I want you to understand this. And 65% when they do a study, they find out that they on average spend $7,500 a year on things that they didn't know they would buy or they didn't need or just kind of like stuff on average. So the money gets spent anyway. Like sometimes we're so scared and we're like, how could I ever spend $300 or $500 a month to invest in the idea of showing up and building something and creating things and changing my mind and putting my things in the world and starting a business, making jewelry, making cupcakes, starting a pot, I could never do that. It's like, well, you're going to do it anyway. Because it's in the data. And this is for people who struggle and we, we overspend and we overspend on stuff that we don't need, that we don't want. So the money gets spent. That's what's insane. And we do it over and over and over again, but we keep living in this limited space and we're not accessing our gifts. So I want to hear some questions. I want to hear some questions. You know, we talk a lot about all of this energetic work because it's 98% of it, right? 98% of what's happening with a toaster is the electricity and 2% is the actual metal thing, 
right? If the electricity is not there, nothing's working. Like, cause if you just had a freaking hot plate and electricity, you get the same result. So it's really not the toaster, although it looks like it is, but that something is 2%. However, it's like that 2%, it's important, right? Like if you don't have the business strategy and skill, then that electricity you can, right? But what, what are you plugging in? So we've talked a lot about that other piece, but you guys, I love making millions of dollars. I enjoy it so much. I enjoy showing other women like, no, 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 enough's enough. Because I need women writing checks for this world to get better. I need women's ideas to get funded. My friend Britt, she raised $100 million in venture capital money this last year during a pandemic. Let me say it again. She raised $100 million in VC money this year during a pandemic for women-owned businesses because she looked at the data and found that only 13%, only 13% of the big companies in the world are run by women. So where do you think the checkbooks are being written from? Who's writing the checks? Who's deciding what's getting funded? Do you think the world would look a little different if every time you had an idea and every time you saw someone and every time you had an idea for a candidate or every time you had an idea for something in the world, you could do something about it? Let's go. It's enough. It's got to stop. It's old. Do you know how much money boys are making with the NFT world right now and cryptocurrency? Only 6% of that world is female. Do you know how many, what percentage of podcasters are female? It's about 13%. So wait, wait a second. Let's look at that. So it's not just how many women are writing checks because they have the checkbook to write it. It's how many voices are being heard. We're not loud enough. And instead of actually taking the mic, we go, there's no reason to, it's too hard. What is King Richard's character? What is Serena Williams, the guy, you know, Will Smith plays their father. And what does he turn to them and say? My mother used to say to me, there's nothing a smart woman can't do. A powerful woman, forget it, right? It's gotta change, you guys. It's gotta change. And it's, it's right here for us. And it's amazing how there's just a difference in the way that people are raised to believe in what's possible. They say that by third grade, if girls are in a mixed classroom, they stop raising their hand to even try at math. And it's not because we're not good at math, it's because the brain just develops differently. So girls are better at math, just a little bit older. The same way that guys are not as good as the English stuff until a little bit later. And they stop raising their hands for that. But that's a big problem. Who's getting what I'm saying? Give me some energy in the chat if you're getting what I'm saying. So I believe that we should normalize. We should normalize it. And when I had Priyanka Chopra on the show, she said, women need to actually be there to praise and support each other. So if you see a woman, right, who's being her full tilt buggy self, you got to go, thank you. As opposed to, look who thinks she because she's making a space for you, right? She's paving a way for you. My friend, Jamie Kern Lima selling her company for $1.2 billion, Sarah Blakely selling her company, right? These people, we gotta say, thank you so much for going there, right? And now let's, let's join, right? You see Reese Witherspoon making this kind of content and being so adamant that women get a voice. Thank you. And let's add ourselves to that. It is enough. And what are you teaching your kids? Right? I have three girls. It's like, they've got to see there ain't nothing. And why do they have to choose? This is another beautiful thought the mind likes to give you. Well, you could do it, but you want to be a mom. So you should choose between the two as if you can't be a good mom and make millions of dollars and change the world. Who said that's true? You know, what's really hard making less than a million dollars. I find that really hard. I find making millions easy. You know why? When you make just enough, 
you're working for someone else. Usually your time is not your own. It's exhausting. You're not juiced up with energy. So it's like, you don't forget the best out of yourself. And then you got to leave your kids to go to some desk or somewhere or be on zoom for someone else's dream. I find that really hard and draining when you decide to believe that thoughts become things and there's a different possibility and you trade your energy for dollars all day long. Well, I'm the one who picks up my kids after school and we hang out all afternoon. And that was sacrosanct for me. So I don't need to do that. And my kids say that to me. They're like, mommy, I swear they say this. Of course they say this. They're like, you show me that that's what I get to do. And you know what I say to them? I'm like, I don't care when they're like, oh, but I have to get good grades because I have to go to college. I'm like, that's not my deal. So if you decide you want to go to college, great. But I would love to see you at the age of 16, 15, 16, 17, like starting your own thing, work for yourself, grow a business, have an idea, speak your mind, put some content in the world. I'll pay for that. Like I'd rather invest in you than invest in college. And then if you want to go to college and you want to read all those books or we can just get the list, let's just get the list of books. Let's just ask Stanford, like, what books do you recommend, right? Unless you want to do a specific thing and then you can go to law school, right? Or you could go get a medical degree. But, oh my God, like, do you notice it's not working? Sir Ken Robinson, who passed away, he wrote this incredible, he wrote so much incredible work on education. And it's, it's just not made for us to fully soar. It wasn't designed that way. So we need to do the things that actually wake us up and get us into innovation and possibility and momentum. And the momentum comes from putting yourself out there, putting it out there. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to be back live with you guys on Zoom at one o'clock and again on Wednesday and I think on Thursday too. So you guys should come back and ask your questions and, and all of that. And you really should use this code 500 party. If you're on here, you can go use this code. You can get $500 off the cost of this program and every single bonus, whether you missed it or not, you can have it. And what is that really? You can really give yourself the gift of going, oh, there is so much I'm going to show up for. And instead of letting my resistance become my life, I'm going to actually live and start to be feeling good and alive and you're going to look back and go, that's the best thing that I did. That's it. It's the best thing that I did. And I'm bringing with me so many of the most incredible people that I know. So you're going to get to spend time with all of these women who are embodying for you this possibility in this life. And, and we, at the end of every single session, I'm going to unmute people and answer your questions at the end of every session with all of my friends. We're going to unmute people. Martha Beck is going to answer people's questions. Candace Nelson is going to answer people's questions. So you're going to have, it's about 40 sessions that I will be live with you for at least 90 minutes. And we will go over not just the fine tuning and memorizing of how to be in alignment with all the real reality, to feel that, to think that way, to wire ourselves into it. But then you'll get all of these really clear, simple, like, of course, that's all I need to do. Did you hear the conversation we just had, right? So most people are going to think, yeah, it doesn't work because I tried to sell it. And it's like, you don't, you just don't know what you don't know. Sales is the intimacy. Sales is the investing. And then some people will say, but I did that, Kath. And I'm like, we've had people who say like, well, I, I followed the, the first part. And I'm like, great, what happened? They're like, yeah, well, people showed up, but then they didn't buy it. It's like, well, when they went to buy it, when you made the invitation, how much were you standing for that possibility? And how much did you shrink in your energy all of a sudden and go into this unworthiness and your story about money? And how much of that did you project so that people all of a sudden felt this person is small? There's no energy. There's no magnet here. I can't feel her anymore. And so I don't want this. And how much were you like, this is such a steal, I'm so excited for you. And how much did you know that the more you charge, the more of a lift that they would get? It feels like such a rush, right? To spend that money on your beliefs, on your dreams, on everything you want. We want to do that. So it's like, we have to change the state. And then sometimes it's very simple things. I'll look at somebody's sales page and I'm like, you're working so hard to prove yourself when really you just need to meet them where they are. 
They need to know they're in the right place. Speak to them, use their language, talk to them, right? I'm not going to show up for my daughter and tell her that she needs to eat a zucchini bran muffin because she won't eat it. I'm going to tell her like, ooh, you want a cupcake? You want something that looks and tastes and smells exactly what you want and look and and then she doesn't she she doesn't want zucchini, but she's going to eat it because I'm going to make sure she eats it because I know she needs it. Right. So it's like sell them what they want. Speak in the way they speak and then give them what they need and know that you just did a blessing for them and make it clean. The codependency has to go. When you believe that your abundance is going to come from each and every person saying yes or no, they feel that that's not clean. That's heavy. That's needy. It's intense. It's bad. It's not going to build your business. When you are clear that your energy, is it just a match for energy? And if it is, it just is. Then people can say what they need. They can say, this isn't for me. And you can say, God bless you because you're not for everybody, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to still be a match for everything that you're still a match for. It, if you really look, it just happens over and over again. Whatever people energetically receive, they just keep receiving and they'll be like, oh my God, no matter what I do, this is exactly what I get back. I wind up in relationships where I always have to do everything or I wind up in this and I'm always at this point, my bank account doesn't move beyond this point. It's like, because you have you, you, you have a set point of what you really allow yourself to expand beyond and your ego is really controlling still. You're, you're, in, you're not in your zone of genius. You're in a zone of confidence and you keep spinning there. Let's open it up. How do I open it up? We really got to rework some of the ways that you're just holding in this limited pattern. We don't understand that we do that, but everybody's doing that to some, some extent. I have a friend who is making money. She's making a million dollars a year, but she couldn't get beyond a million dollars a year. And we talked about it and she started to cry when I started asking her all these questions. And she said that she just had this belief that after a million dollars, like she felt shame. She felt the people that she grew up with would think like, why are you so greedy? And she couldn't get past it. And I changed it. And I was like, you got to get some work done because that money is not for you to hold on to my friend. It's for, it's just got to keep going. And the more you rise, the more I said, how many people you think you can lift if you can't lift yourself to the level of really allowing yourself to receive? And we don't realize how we, we become the people we spend time with. So who are you a stand for? And when people are around you, you give off a certain amount of what's possible and what's not. And then we don't even realize we're wiring each other into reality beliefs all the time. So it's like, what reality do you want to project in the world? Do you want to project scarcity and rejection and being needing people to like you and being afraid to go live and not putting your creativity in the world and there's nobody out there it's like so who are the friends that you'll have and how interesting are those conversations they get so boring fear tricks us into living such a boring life it's so boring it's like be around people and start to talk and think a different way you'll start attracting different opportunities different experiences the money will start pouring in and it's like, it's enough already. You know, like she said before, um, Rach said before, she's like, and I don't really need it. You know, my husband works and this and that. And I hear a lot of women say that and it's fine. I get it. I understand. But you know how many times I hear women say, let me check with my husband, right? Let me just ask him, like, if we can spend this money. It's like, damn it. It's like, he should check with you, right? My husband has, it's true. Like he, he doesn't really get to weigh in. It's like, I'm like, honey, I, I generate eight figures in this house. So it's like, we're, we're just going. And he's like, where do we go? It's like, that's what we're doing. You know, we're buying a cat. We're going to Tennessee. We're taking the kids out of school for a week. And there are times where he feels strongly and he's like, da, 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 da. and I'm like, okay, let me hear your case. And then I'm like, and no scene, we're not doing it. And my husband is such a risk averse person. He went to UCLA undergrad. He went to USC law school. He went to UCLA business school and he got a very practical job and his father dropped dead unexpectedly when his father was in his early fifties. And my husband was living 
already, his parents were immigrants. They didn't go to college. They lived in a tiny little apartment. They had no money. He took the bus till he was 23. He put himself through law school, put himself through business school, was the, like, hold on to money, never spend anything, hold on to it, hold on to it. His, his mother lived in a rent controlled apartment until she passed away. And it was like this, this. And I used to say, what do you really dream about? And he's like, don't even ask that. Let's just, let's just be secure. Let's just be secure, you know? And worked so hard, worked so hard, spent so much money on school so that he could get the top of the top of the top of the job you could get eventually in an organ, in an, at, a, at, a, at a company, which has a ceiling and you pay taxes on it. And it's like, it's amazing. And then his company, he worked at Fox Sports for 15 years and he was vice president of business and legal. And then meanwhile, we couldn't afford to buy a house in Los Angeles. It didn't matter that he was working that hard and had climbed that ladder because we had, before we bought our first house, we had two children. We were living in an apartment, renting an apartment. It was the upstairs of a duplex and there were these nails sticking up in these brown wooden stairs that I had to climb every single night, bringing the kids upstairs, right? We didn't have a washer or dryer. And I'm, so, I'm not saying that like, oh, people have it way worse. They do. And this was the reality. And we like couldn't, every time we would go to buy a house, it was like, oh, it's a minimum of a million dollars for a piece of garbage. And I was like, holy crap. And he would just say, that's just the reality. Just, you'll just get used to it. And I was like, I'm not gonna get used to it because there's no reason that we should have to choose this life. Our kids should have a backyard. There's nothing wrong with it. And we should be able to, I kept seeing us. I used to think about having incredible people speak in my living room, raising money in my living room, being philanthropic in my living room. And I was like, I'm, I'm not gonna not do that because I have the passion. I'll be able to stand up and introduce that person and we'll raise money. And we, what did we do? We went and did that. And so I was like, I better get it together because he's not, he doesn't see it. So it won't happen. And I started to just make money and make money and make money. And then we bought our first house quickly. We bought our second house. When we bought our third house in LA, which was like almost $4 million, we were driving to Disney on ice. And he was like, you're going to bankrupt us. There's no way we can afford this. I can't afford even half of this payment. What are you doing? And I was like, we're good. We're fine. Forget $300 a month. You should have seen what I was signing that my mortgage was going to be. And I was like, it's done because I'm a match for it. And then from there, it was like, we were looking at houses that were seven and a half million dollars. And he was like, okay, I fold. You got it. You're fine. And I was like, look what it took. Holy crap. Because he grew up with so much scarcity, right? So I have had it. And I remember up until I really got angry about it, I used to say, what can we buy? How much money can we spend? And he was like, don't even ask me. This is as much as we can spend. <laughs> you know, because his dad had died and there was trauma. Like he needed to see the money in the bank. He didn't want to spend it. And I was like, God, that costs you so much. Boy, are you costing yourself so much money by not being willing to step into. And now, oh, so I was going to say he worked at Fox Sports for 15 years as VP. And it was like, oh, well, at least he has security. And then you guys, I blew right past him. I wound up making what he made. Then I made double what he made. Then I made five times what he made. Then I made 12 times what he made. Then I made 22 times what he made. And I was like, are we done? Can you quit your job yet? No, couldn't quit. Couldn't quit, was so scared, so scared. And then Fox got bought by Disney and Disney owns ESPN. So Fox Sports was like done, right? And he was fired, like not fired. He was actually given severance because it was like a, a positive thing, but I was like, what do you have to show for 15 years of your effing life, 40 hours a week sitting at a boring job? And then I convinced him, oh God, is he the most stubborn person? I convinced him to start a podcast because what he really has always wanted to do is comedy. And he was like, it'll never work. I'll never do anything with it. And I was like, could you just get over your ego? I'm so sick of it. Why don't you just let, you're so funny. You were the person in high school who everyone like, most funny, most witty. You're funny. That's your real gift, not being a lawyer. And do you know who's, who he's interviewing February 9th? Paul Reiser. Do you know who he just interviewed? Colin Quinn. Do you know who he's interviewing at the end of February? Jerry Seinfeld. This is facts. It took me two years to convince him to start a podcast. Oh, and here's the other thing. I didn't do a thing. I didn't send an email for him. I didn't tell anyone about that they should be on his show. What I did was move him into that space of possibility. And he finally surrendered to it. 
And then the next day we were walking down the street in Los Angeles and we bumped into this guy who's a comedian, Mark Schiff, who's been opening for Jerry Seinfeld for 20 years. And we love him. We've seen him live. And I'm like, Mark. And he's like, oh, hi, what's your name? And I was like, we've seen you. I was doubled over. You're so funny. We saw you open for Jerry, blah, 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 blah. He was with his wife. He's like, this is my wife, Nancy. And I said, hi, these are my kids. They're on their scooters. And I say to him, my husband, this is what I did. My husband's starting a podcast about comedy. And um, I actually have a podcast and he goes, oh, what's your podcast? And I tell him and he goes, I've heard of it. Oh my God, I've listened to it. Nancy, do you remember? I listened, I told you Kevin Nealon was on that show and I heard it and she was great. He goes, I'm totally up for it. And that was what I did. And I said to my husband, you manifested that because you finally got out of your own way. Why would we bump into him the next day? Because you allowed us to. You guys, I'm not joking. So now he's interviewing literally the most famous comedians. They're launching February 22nd. It's going to be insane. And he's, this is the best part. He's going to open for Mark. So he's going on tour. He wrote his set and it's hysterical. And then he got an email out of the blue from a friend of ours, because we have parent friends in LA who are in writing comedy. And one of them works for, well, was working for Conan and used to work for Fallon. And out of nowhere, because we had just had dinner and we were talking about what he was doing. So he became a match for this. He's like, I just got a call from Jimmy Fallon. Like literally he got a call and he was like, he was looking for new writers and I told him about you and he wants you to send a packet. So my husband went to New York and had a meeting with the Tonight Show at 48. I go, you were sitting at a desk at Fox for 15 years because that was reality and there's nothing else. And don't you tell me, Kath, with your little pipe dreams. And I'm like, oh, buckle up. So I forced him to let me take him to Bloomingdale so he could get like a cool hoodie because he's like got only dress shirts. I was like, you need an Aviator Nation sweatshirt. You're going to wear this to the meeting and act like a human being. You're not going to wear a suit. You're not going to, like, oh my God, I'm going to wear sweatshirts. And I was like, you're going to wear sweatshirts and call it an effing day so that you're normal. And he's hysterical. And the whole set is about me and how I am crazy in like all these ways. Like he has my, like Kathy should have a motivational doll. You can do this. Who does this? You're not a cat. You're a tiger. You're the, like, it's hysterical. And we're so different. And I'm so excited for him. And his favorite comedian since he's a child is Rodney Dangerfield. And if you study Rodney Dangerfield's story, he didn't have his break till he was 48. Who's excited about what's possible? Let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, you will see his set. You will see it. I'll let you know. He's starting down here and then we'll see where he winds up, but I'll definitely post it once he's out and about. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's all here for us and we got to start doing it and showing up for it. Stop saying, let me convince you of my limitations. Let me have dinner with someone and tell them, no, I'm not doing that. I'll tell you why. Let me spend an hour at dinner telling people why, like, I'm never going to start that thing. And let me tell you that the people who do those things and how terrible, let's spend, let's talk about that. Let's do that. Every time we hang out, let's talk about what's not possible and the people who actually have it, how they're really scum. And then we'll just, we'll just go to bed. It'll be great. Or let's do what we're supposed to do. Get really fired up, inspire other people, start making stuff, start having fun, start printing all this money and then realize, oh, you don't need that much of it. So once you have a lot of it, you just wind up writing checks to things that you care about. That's what you get to do. And then you're like, oh, that's really fun. What else can I care about? Like, that's what I spend a lot of my free time doing is like looking at causes and going, boom, just gave them some money, put some energy over here. And then I get on the board. I get on the phone meetings and I'm like, no, we got to change it. I don't like your rhetoric. I don't like what you're saying. And like, I have this like opinion all of a sudden people care about. I have a Zoom call three days this week. I tell my team like, okay, I need to talk to this person. This or it's like, what the hell's happening? Like, why am I all of a sudden getting a say in like what's happening in these places. It's like, cause I sent them some money. And the other day somebody said to me, well, could you give us $180,000? And I was like, that's how much you need. Okay. And then, then from there, she's like, okay, so you'll be the person who will do this for you and this for you. And this, I was like, I don't need any of that. I don't need any of that, but I would like you to listen to what I have to say. Like, absolutely. I was like, this is insane. And it's stuff I really, 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 really care about. So Anyways, 
anyways, um, this has been really fun. I'm going to be back tomorrow. Get your butt in this class, right? You know, if you need to do it, if you need to do it, get in there and bring your friend with you and say like, oh, we're going to keep each other accountable. So if you use this code by midnight 500 party, you're going to get $500 off. You're going to get all the bonuses and you're going to get to work and it's going to be amazing and it's going to be fun. And we're starting February 7th and I will be back at one o'clock tomorrow, Eastern time. Who's excited? This was really, really fun. I love spending time. And I will say this, this is the truth. I never know what I'm going to do again. So people are like, are you going to do this again in five months? And I'm like, probably not. I have no idea what I'm going to do in five months, but five months ago, I launched a podcasting course just on podcasting for eight weeks, which was three grand for eight weeks. Just to talk about podcasting, which was really, really cool. And now I'm doing this and there's a high probability that because I'm writing my second book and going on tour with my podcast and shooting this show that I might not be able to do this live again. And it might be, I might have to do something else. So that is there. And that's the truth. And that's fine. So those of you who want to have this experience live, do it now. Have an amazing day. This was really fun. Thanks for being such an awesome community. It's very supportive. Have you ever seen a Facebook group where there's no negativity? I'm blown away by you people. Who are these people that I get to attract and be with? I'm mesmerized. It's incredible. Go to abundanteverafter.com.